If you were born before 2000, you probably heard this familiar story. The current layout of the English keyboard called QWERTY because of the first six letters in the top row was designed to slow typists down. Mechanical typewriters could jam if people hit the keys too quickly, so the designer separated common letters as far as possible. For example, the letter I is the fourth most common letter and it's placed far from the S key, the eighth most common letter. So this was a holdover from the mechanical age where typists grew comfortable and used to the QWERTY layout on typewriters, and designers kept the familiar layout when making digital keyboards. This is an idea called path dependency, where the continued use of a product is based on historical preference or use. Here's the thing. This story about the QWERTY keyboard is likely untrue. Let me explain. Let me start with an easy example. Remember how I said that the QWERTY keyboard was designed to slow typists down? Well, there's a reason I had to use the letter I versus the letter S to supposedly prove that point. That explanation of the QWERTY layout can be easily debunked. For example, the letters E and R are the fourth most common pairing of letters in the English language. They're also right next to each other on the QWERTY keyboard. In fact, the three most common English letters, E, A, and R, are all right by each other. So why is the QWERTY layout actually designed this way. For that answer, you have to start with Christopher Scholes. Christopher Scholes was a politician, printer, newspaper man, and amateur inventor from Milwaukee. In the 1860s, Scholes patented an early typewriter with help from his colleagues Carlos Glidden, Samuel Willard Soleil, and James Densmore. Writing machines had been invented before, like this weird-looking Hansen writing ball, but they weren't yet commercially successful. So, Scholes and his team tried to make a more efficient device. Their first typewriter featured just 28 keys, including the alpha its letters in order and without numbers. Scholes sold the first device to the principal at Porter's Telegraph College in Ohio. However, in order to receive Morse Telegraph and to write it down, the principal needed numerals added to the typewriter. So the newer model had a line for numbers plus additional punctuation. Here, vowels were allegedly moved to the top row while most of the other keys remained the same. Scholes and his team then presented their device to the American Telegraph Works, who promised to purchase some of the typewriters if certain other changes were made. So Sometimes Morse receivers in the United States could not determine whether Z or SE is being received, especially in the first letters of a word, before they receive subsequent letters. So the S was placed near both Z and E on the keyboard for Morse receivers to type them quickly. Other letters were shifted around in response to American Telegraph Works demands, while half remained where they were. Scholes made one last edit, for no documented reason, moving the Y to the top of the keyboard. The earliest model of the QWERTY layout was born. Obviously, when looking at this design, you can tell that it's a little off from the present day layout. That's because Scholes and his colleagues entered into a manufacturing deal with Remington, the gun maker who also developed sewing machines. It was massively successful. By 1890, there were more than 100,000 QWERTY-based Remington-produced typewriters in use across the country. After the commercial success of the first QWERTY typewriter, Remington entered into a new manufacturing deal with another company, Wyckoff Siemens & Benedict, or WS&B. To avoid issues with the the original patent from Scholes, the new model from Remington and ws and moved some of the letters around, such as the C and X swapping places. The QWERTY layout was finally complete. The development of QWERTY's layout is somewhat foggy and not entirely rational, but it doesn't really explain how it stuck around. There's multiple reasons why. Firstly, after Remington started selling these typewriters, they also offered typing courses for a small fee. So Remington was effectively getting customers used to their setup. Once that way of typing was familiar, typists wouldn't want to buy a different product and learn a new keyboard layout. This is that idea of path dependency. Secondly, after the second version was released, the five largest typewriter manufacturers, including Remington, merged to form the Union Typewriter Company under the shareholder supervision of ws and and agreed to adopt QWERTY as the de facto standard layout. The market became saturated with QWERTY keyboards to the point that there were no other options. When typing became electronic, people were already familiar with with QWERTY and kept using it. But today there are other options, but they don't really have an opportunity to catch on since QWERTY dominates the keyboard market. Scholes himself, the original creator, thought that the QWERTY format was not the most efficient and he distanced himself from the design in later years. One of these options presented in the 1930s was the Dvorak Simplified Keyboard. Introduced by Dr. August Dvorak, the new layout dramatically increases the number of words that can be typed using the home row of keys where your fingers naturally rest. 
test. Later studies have debunked the claim that it makes you a faster typist, but it doesn't really matter. The Dvorak format didn't even have a chance to catch on. But there's also another alternative that has cropped up more recently. That's the Calc keyboard designed to split the keyboard for two thumbs when holding a screen. Released in 2013, a study showed that it was 34% faster for touchscreen typists. Yet again, the familiarity and domination of the QWERTY format couldn't be beat. The Calc format has received a little buzz since its 2013 announcement, and it's still listed as a beta. Despite the possibility of future developments, the Calc system, or any comparable system, can also be viewed as a result of path dependency. Regardless of how the letters are organized, the fundamental concept of individually separated letters dispersed across a grid can be traced back to Scholl's and his team's work. Even though this grid layout is not strictly necessary in a tablet, it has persisted. Beyond its historical significance, the QWERTY keyboard story offers valuable insights into the path dependence of technology. Once a technology achieves a dominant position, it can be difficult to dislodge, even if better alternatives emerge. This phenomenon is not unique to keyboards. We see it in everything from operating systems to video formats, where the initial winner often enjoys a lasting advantage due to factors like user familiarity and compatibility. The QWERTY keyboard is a reminder that the history of technology is not always a linear progression toward the absolute best solution, but rather a complex interplay of innovation, practicality, and historical contingency. If you like this video, please consider liking and subscribing. It helps me know what interests my audience, and it also helps me grow my channel. You can also check out my Patreon. The link is in the bio.